Right, um, thank you very much for inviting me today. It's a real honor to be here speaking with you all, uh, my esteemed colleagues and uh, guests here at this uh, convention. Um, so before I start off, I just want to uh, provide a bit of a caveat to, uh, to what was uh, just uh, used to introduce myself there. Um, the, the, the idea that there's no such thing as cardio is a little bit of a strong statement, perhaps, and uh, I think some of the ideas that myself and my colleagues have published around this area have been um, overstated uh, to some degree. So I want to just start off by saying that the purposes of this, uh, purposes of this talk is to highlight the fact that there is some evidence to question the typical dichotomy between the two different modes of exercise typically associated with aerobic and resistance type training. Um, so we're questioning the idea that these two different modalities of exercise typically produce differential um, adaptive responses. Okay, so uh, is this going to work? Don't worry, I can... Uh, there we go. I can just do it the old-fashioned way. Okay, so to start off with then, um, I want to provide some context to why I think it's necessary to potentially question the typically, uh, typically held dichotomy within exercise physiology. And I think the uh, perfect context to provide is around what other speakers have uh, spoke about at the beginning of their presentations, and that's the public health impact of uh, exercise. So I want to first start off by talking around some of the uh, benefits of exercise um, in terms of both uh, volume and intensity of effort of exercise and what impact that has on different risk factors associated with morbidity and mortality. Then I'm going to start talking about the actual resistance aerobic training dichotomy as it's typically presented and characterized within exercise physiology before then moving on to starting to potentially look at what data leads me to question whether or not this firmly held tenant is as true as, uh, as it's typically held. I then want to propose a counter hypothesis to uh, this typical kind of dichotomy, something which myself and my colleagues have put forward, and I'm by no means saying that there's robust evidence to firmly conclude that it's, uh, it's the uh, correct answer at this time. Um, and as a result of that, I want to highlight some of the areas for future research before concluding. Is it working now? No? I can carry on doing it the old-fashioned way, that's fine. Okay, so to start off with then, the current state of public health, it's important to highlight where we currently are. And I think in basic terms, we're pretty screwed at the moment. So, are we, am I going to get a new one? Yes. Look at that. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so, to highlight some of the statistics around the current state of public health. Overweight and obesity are currently on the rise, and these are some of the statistics over the last few years of obesity prevalence rates in the UK and in the US. And we can see they've been on the rise for a number of years. And obesity and overweight, we know, are typically associated with increased mortality risks from a number of different areas, cardiovascular, increased risk of death from cancers, and other all-cause mortalities as well. Now, overweight and obesity are typically associated with inactivity, but it's important to highlight that inactivity and overweight and obesity seem to be independent risk factors for morbidity and mortality. And this has led many people to uh, highlight what, what is being called the fat but fit paradigm. So there's plenty of evidence to show nowadays that exercise or physical activity independently has a positive effect um, with regards to health and longevity, independent of the negative impact of obesity and overweight. And this quote from an early review from Stephen Blair's colleagues, overweight and obese individuals who are active and fit have lower rates of disease and death than overweight and obese individuals who are inactive and unfit. So, Physical activity and exercise we know protects against all-cause mortality in a typically dose-response fashion. So in general terms, greater amounts of, uh, oh no, that is working, there we go. Greater volumes of physical activity and exercise seem to have a greater impact on all-cause mortality. And because of this early data around volume of activity and exercise, most physical activity guidelines are based around the accumulation of a minimum volume of exercise. However, more recently, studies are starting to question the relevance of the volume of physical activity and exercise. There's been criticism around the time associated with completing those uh, exercise recommendations and the fact that when the current guidelines are met, there's typically a very marginal reduction in all-cause mortality. But seemingly, at all volumes of exercise, there seems to be a greater impact of the intensity of effort associated with that exercise. So higher effort exercise seems to have a bigger impact on all-cause mortality risk. Now, you might be asking why might that be, and I think one of the answers around that might be the impact it has on fitness-related factors associated with all-cause mortality. So, 
when we look at some of the research from church and colleagues, even when the physical activity guidelines as they're currently put forward are exceeded by up to 50%, there is only a very marginal improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness and coronary heart disease risk factors. Now, this is important because independent of overweight, obesity, physical activity volumes, and even intensity levels, there seems to be a big impact of the actual fitness levels that participants have. So cardiorespiratory fitness in a number of studies has been shown to be associated again with all-cause mortality. And again, we see that in the overweight yet metabolically obese, we see an increase, uh, sorry, a, uh, an increased risk, and in those who are normal, uh, sorry, other way around, those who are obese yet metabolically healthy have a higher cardiorespiratory fitness, and conversely, those who are normal weight yet metabolically obese seem to have a lower cardiorespiratory fitness, tying in with this fat but fit paradigm. We also see that strength as a variable has an impact on all-cause mortality, and a number of studies have shown that those in higher strength categories seem to have a far reduced all-cause mortality and risk of cancer mortality as well. And this has been looked at in both leg extension and studies using hand grip strength as a proxy for overall muscular strength. Muscle mass as well seems to have a big impact. So a recent study has looked at uh, what's been termed muscle mass index. So instead of looking at body mass index, looking at the uh, uh, ratio of muscle mass or lean mass to height squared. And they found that those in the higher quartiles of muscle mass index seem to have a lower risk, again, of all-cause mortality. And combined, studies have shown that although strength seems to potentially have a bigger impact, those who are in higher fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness categories have a reduced risk, and those in higher strength categories also have a reduced risk for all-cause mortality. Now, because of the recent research that's highlighted that potentially the intensity of effort of exercise is an important factor when it comes to all-cause mortality, health, longevity, the public health paradigm, we've seen a number of, uh, of papers recently promoting the benefits of higher intensity of effort exercise for a public health perspective. So we've got guys like Stu Phillips and Rich Winnett who have been putting forward the idea that resistance training could potentially be put forward for a public health mandate. We've also got the boon of high intensity interval training at the moment which recently culminated in a fantastic debate between Alan Batterham and Stu Biddle at a recent conference in Edinburgh. Now, the high-intensity exercise movement, high-intensity of effort exercise movement, seems to address one of the key factors uh, that, uh, that's a barrier to exercise participation, and that's time. Most people cite that time is a massive factor when it comes to taking part in exercise. However, an often overlooked factor is the accessibility to facilities, equipment, and so on. So even in early reviews, there was findings that access, access to uh, facilities, programs, environments that permit participants to take part in exercise was associated with their volume of physical activity. And again, a recent study as well highlighted that there was a strong association with the facilities available. And again, conclusion from early reviews, access to facilities, access to exercise equipment at home, and so on, seems to have a big impact on whether people actually take part in exercise. So it led me to think that most people seem to have this idea that exercise can only be performed in a certain place at a certain time with special equipment. So I started thinking, well, what if people could choose any exercise modality, just focus on the effort in that given activity, and improve the range of fitness-related factors that are associated with health and longevity? So this was what led me to start questioning the typical resistance aerobic training dichotomy in exercise physiology. And this is typically how it's presented. So way back when, people started thinking that strength training and strength-related sports produce certain adaptations related to strength and muscle mass, whereas the more endurance-based sports typically had bigger impacts on the more aerobic cardiorespiratory fitness factors. Now, the problem with a lot of this early research was that it's based on observations of the typical phenotypes that are seen associated with those sports. Now, it's hard to say whether or not the sports themselves were producing those phenotypes or whether those particular participants were more likely to participate in those sports. But there are a number of events historically that seem to forge this uh, dichotomy and strengthen it. So back in the 1970s, Ken Cooper published his book, Aerobics, and the aerobics trend blew up. People believed that taking part in aerobic exercise was beneficial for cardiorespiratory fitness, and that that was the only way for you to improve your cardiorespiratory fitness. 
We also have in the 1980s, Hickson first demonstrated the idea that taking part in both aerobic type exercise and resistance strength training type exercise had an interference effect. So there seemed to be mutually exclusive adaptations to the two. And more recently, on a molecular basis, we've seen that there seem to be antagonistic signaling pathways with uh, Phil Atherton's publication around the AMPK, PKB or AKT switch. So there certainly seems to be some sort of antagonism between the different pathways that stimulate certain adaptations relating to different exercise types. And reviews recently have highlighted this, predominantly based on the molecular evidence, that different pathways are stimulated with different contraction types. Now, the problem with this is that most of these studies have looked at the typical nature of uh, aerobic exercise, which is typically long, slow duration, and resistance training is typically a higher intensity, a lower volume, uh, lower duration of exercise. And uh, I won't have time to go through that for the moment. So for the purposes of this talk, what I want to talk about is the modes of exercise typically associated with them. Because this is one of the things that's often overlooked yet assumed. People seem to associate certain modes of exercise as being aerobic, like cycling, running, rowing, swimming, and so on. And people associate certain types of exercise or modes of exercise as being resistance exercise. So free weights, resistance machines, calisthenics, or body weight exercises. So this is what the focus of this talk is going to be about, whether or not the actual mode, the actual mode of external resistance has an impact on the adaptations independent of manipulation of other exercise variables. So, as I said, myself and my colleagues have published some work around this recently, beginning to question whether or not the resistance aerobic training dichotomy is really as true as it's typically been held to be. So we started asking questions such as, can resistance training produce improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness? Because if it can, then that begins to question this typically held dichotomy. We also asked well, what kind of mechanisms might be involved in that if that's the case. And also, if it does produce improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness, is the improvement equivalent to those that seen in typical aerobic exercise? Conversely, we ask the same questions about aerobic exercise. Can aerobic exercise produce improvements in strength and hypertrophy? And again, what mechanisms might be involved? And again, is that improvement potentially similar to produced through uh, resistance training? Sorry, there's a typo on the slide there. Okay, so let's work our way through these questions and see what evidence there currently is. Now, again, I'll provide the caveat at the moment that the evidence is limited around this area, but I believe there's enough to begin questioning this and prompting further research around this idea. Okay, so can resistance exercise produce improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness? Well, a colleague of ours in uh, Japan, Hayao Ozaki, has published a number of systematic reviews recently looking at the impact of resistance training on cardiorespiratory fitness. And they found that uh, resistance training does indeed produce improvements in factors such as VO2 max, but it seems to be dependent upon the initial fitness values. So when they extracted the values of initial fitness and the changes in VO2 max from the studies they looked at, there seemed to be this negative relationship. So the fitter individuals had the uh, smaller improvements in VO2 max. However, that doesn't seem to just be only applicable to resistance exercise because that's the case with any exercise. The level of trainability seems to impact the degree of adaptations produced. So even if you were doing aerobic exercise, the fitter you are to begin with, the smaller your improvements are going to be. Now, interestingly as well, they found that most of the, chain, the studies that looked at uh, resistance exercise and its impact on VO2 max found improvements in this variable independent of what the load used was, what the volume was, what rest periods were used, and the frequency of exercise as well. Now again, there was limited evidence drawing comparisons between manipulations of these variables, so it's difficult to say conclusively whether or not these have little impact, but certainly at the moment it seems they don't. However, one of the things they didn't look at was that of uh, the repeti repetition cessation criteria used. So whether the participants trained to, as Jürgen spoke about earlier, a repetition maximum, or they trained to failure, or they stopped at an arbitrary number of repetitions. So this is something that myself and my colleagues looked at in a review, and we found that in those studies that did not have participants trained to muscular failure, they typically showed no improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness measured by VO2 max. Whereas in all the studies that they had participants trained to muscular failure, so high intensity of effort, they seem to show consistent improvements in VO2 max. So I think that's important. Certainly with regards to improvements in VO2 max from resistance training, there seems to be an impact of the intensity of effort used. <laughs> 
Now, economy of movement is also a uh, variable used to determine the cardiorespiratory fitness of someone. So for those of you who aren't aware of what economy of movement refers to, it's sometimes spoken about as running economy or cycling economy. If you were to have two individuals run at the same speed on a treadmill, the individual that was using a lower oxygen cost would be the more economical person. They're using less energy, less oxygen to produce the same output. Now, again, we found in our review that there's studies that show that resistance exercise improves re uh, economy of movement in both young athletes and older individuals. There seems to be a lack of research on untrained persons, certainly, and most of these studies have used quite complex periodized uh, resistance training interventions because they've been done in current athletes. But there seems to be some consistency that resistance training can produce improvements in this cardiorespiratory variable. Um, however, unlike VO2 max, there was a lack of research for us to draw any conclusions conclusions with regards to the uh, role of intensity of effort on this outcome in particular. Lactate threshold is another factor which is often used out as a marker of uh, cardiorespiratory fitness or endurance performance. And again, this is the one area where there seems to be very, very little research. Only two studies that I could find in this area. One in untrained individuals showed that it may improve lactate threshold. However, a study in uh, trained participants showed very, very little change. But again, as with VO2 max, it's important to consider that level of trainability may have been a factor there. Okay, so aside from the kind of measurements we would take in the lab, studies have also shown that endurance performance, so the actual output related to cardiorespiratory fitness, seems to improve consistently as a result of training to momentary muscular failure using resistance training again. So in studies, again, where they've had participants trained to failure, they've shown consistent improvements in time to exhaustion trials and velocity at VO2 max, which actually is an important factor, certainly from an athletic perspective, because in that subpopulation, it seems to be more strongly associated with performance as opposed to VO2 max itself. Okay, so in our review, we started asking, well, what sort of mechanisms could be responsible for this? And this is just a schematic that we presented in our paper to discuss some of the uh, potential acute mechanisms that might be driving these adaptations. Now, typically, um, as I said earlier, the uh, AMPK, PKB, AKT, AKT pathway seem to be antagonistic. So they seem to inhibit one another. And typically, it's thought that AMPK is stimulated during endurance type exercise because there's a change in the AMP to ATP ratio. So as ATP is used during long duration uh, exercise, the AMP uh, uh, concentration increases, AMPK is activated and it seems to be a primary determinant of adaptations related to cardiorespiratory or aerobic performance, such as mitochondrial biogenesis, changes in capillary uh, uh, capillarization, changes in mitochondrial enzymes. And uh, in the early studies that uh, were published by Afton and his colleagues, this seemed to be the case. However, recently after that, there were a number of studies published using resistance exercise models where participants were trained to a high intensity of effort, if not failure, and they showed that actually in the early stages after resistance exercise, there was an increase in AMPK activity. So there's the potential that resistance exercise have performed to a high intensity of effort could stimulate this, metabolic part, uh, this molecular pathway and potentially produce those chronic adaptations. And in fact, a recent study published in PLOS One used a model where they had participants perform work volume matched resistance exercise. In one condition, they achieved muscular failure. In one condition, they avoided muscular, muscular failure. And they showed that there was a significant reduction in the AMP to ATP ratio, or in this case, an increase in the ATP to AMP ratio, uh, with, uh, sorry, all the way around, with the condition that led to failure as opposed to the condition that did not lead to failure. So there's a potential there for that pathway to be involved. Now, there are also potentially uh, cardiovascular adaptations at the periphery that seem to occur. There's an increased shear rate from uh, increased blood flow, which may stimulate capillarization type adaptations to exercise as well. Now, I'm going to move on before I get bogged down too much in talking about all the details of this, but I'd suggest that you potentially have a look at our review papers to get more details around that. So, these acute mechanisms seem to potentially be involved in chronic adaptations. And a number of studies, again, have shown that when resistance exercise is performed to a high intensity of effort, there seems to be an increase in mitochondrial enzymes, an increase, uh, um, increased mitochondrial prolifer proliferation, and a switch to a more oxidative phenotype. So there's a shift from type 2X to type 2A fibers, and in some studies, an increase in type 1 fibers also as well. There's also an increase in capillary contacts and capillary to fiber ratio. All of these factors are physiological adaptations that are associated with the typical improvements in functional cardiorespiratory outcomes that we've seen already. 
Now, the important question is whether or not these adaptations uh, are similar to what's produced through typical aerobic exercise. Now, this is where the studies are really limited, unfortunately, and this is the real gap in the literature. I think there's potentially evidence to suggest this may be the case, or to certainly put the hypothesis forward, but there needs to be more rigorous studies around this. So I'm going to give you a quick run through of what studies do exist in this area. So, an early study by Messier and Dill had three groups. They had one group performing free weight resistance exercise, one group performing Nautilus-based circuit training, where the participants did train to failure, and they had a group performing endurance running type aerobic activity. And there were in this study similar improvements in VO2 max in all the uh, ways in which they looked at it between the Nautilus group and the endurance running group. And there seemed to be no significant differences between those two groups, certainly in this study. Goldberg et al. also looked at resistance exercise performed to momentary muscular failure compared to an endurance running uh, aerobic exercise group. Now, they did show there were improvements in VO2 max in the resistance exercise group, but they did look qualitatively much larger in the uh, um, endurance running group. However, unfortunately, there's some limitations with the way this paper was presented in that there was no details of the statistical methods employed, there was no within-group comparisons, and no between-group comparisons between the uh, two groups there. And with the sample size they used, we don't know whether or not this was just a type 2 error or not. So we need larger sample sizes potentially to look at this. A recent study which looked at 29 uh, overweight postmenopausal females, again looked at resistance training performed to muscular failure, and they looked at a cycling and rowing aerobic exercise type intervention. And again, they showed very similar improvements in VO2 max expressed in relative terms with no difference between the groups there. Heppel and colleagues again looked at VO2 max. You'll notice there's a trend here. Most studies seem to have compared aerobic and resistance exercise for VO2 max as opposed to other variables. And they did show that there was a significant uh, improvement in VO2 max in both the running, uh, the resistance training and the endurance cycling group. Um, again, though, they didn't provide any between group comparisons. So although both groups improved and it's seemingly the cycling group seemed to improve more, um, it's difficult to say whether or not that was statistically significant or not. Heppel and colleagues did also report a uh, comparison of capillary supply as well. So they looked at um, capillary contacts. And interestingly, they found that there was a significant improvement in the uh, number of capillary contacts in the resistance exercise condition as compared to the aerobic exercise condition. So in this study, they had participants perform nine weeks of resistance training and then nine weeks of aerobic training. One alternative group performed nine weeks of aerobic training and then another nine weeks of aerobic training. And it seemed that over the initial nine weeks, where we can draw modality comparisons between the two, but the resistance exercise group had a greater improvement in uh, capillary uh, contacts. And also, the change in capillarization seemed to be positively associated with the change in functional outcomes in VO2 max as well. Okay, a study by Jabouis and colleagues as well also looked at more physiological outcomes. They looked at muscle oxidative capacity and mitochondrial volume density. And again, they show that there were significant improvements in both the resistance exercise group and the aerobic exercise group. However, again, there was no between group comparisons for the two interventions used. Now, one of the reasons around this is I think that these studies weren't necessarily set up to test the hypothesis that there may be differences or there may not be differences between the interventions used. I think they were more set up as proof of principle ideas looking at these types of interventions in predominantly older populations. Okay, last study then, and this was a within-group study uh, by Wilkinson and colleagues. They actually had participants perform one leg, did resistance exercise, one leg did aerobic type exercise. Um, and in this study, they did seem to show that uh, there was a significantly greater improvement in VO2 max in the, uh, resistant, uh, the aerobic exercise group, whereas the resistance exercise group had a small decrease or, or no change at all. Um, and in terms of muscle state of capacity, again, the aerobic exercise group seemed to have a greater improvement. So, quick summary then. Most studies, though not all of them, show that resistance exercise to a high intensity of effort or to momentary muscular failure seems to produce some improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness. And it may be similar to aerobic exercise, but I don't think we have enough evidence to draw that firm conclusion yet. Because we have a limited number of studies and there's not many studies that have directly compared the magnitude of changes between these exercise modes. Okay, so that's aerobic, uh, sorry, resistance training's effects on aerobic outcomes. What about the converse of that? What about the effects of aerobic exercise on improvements in strength and hypertrophy? Okay, so 
Aerobic exercise again. Ozaki and uh, his colleagues have performed a number of re reviews in this area, and there's a, num a number of studies now which show that aerobic exercise can improve strength and it can improve hypertrophy. There's no question about that. If we look at ambulatory exercise, one of the interesting things we see again, though, is that the higher the effort of aerobic type exercise, the greater the improvements we typically tend to see. So there's more evidence supporting the idea that if we use something like blood flow restriction training, we get a greater improvement in terms of uh, strength and hypertrophy uh, than if we were just to be performing a very low intensity aerobic type exercise. So increasing the intensity of effort involved with this mode of exercise seems to have a big impact. In this study, in this meta-analysis, they looked at cycling, and uh, again, that this supports that there is an improvement in strength and an improvement in muscle mass as a result of aerobic type training. Um, but one of the things they showed was that there seemed to be uh, take a longer duration for these adaptations to become significant when performing cycling type training. Okay, so the improvements as a result of uh, aerobic type training seem to be uh, dependent upon aerobic exercise modality. And I think this is likely due to the nature in which those typical modalities are performed. So if we look at the uh, results of these reviews, we seem to find that higher effort exercise seems to have a greater effect. So this includes things like high intensity interval training uh, or blood flow restriction combined with aerobic exercise. There does seem to be a negative effect of high volume, high effort exercise, so things like marathon training or continuous high effort exercise protocols on, on the bike. There seems to be either a very small positive effect or no effect at all from that. Whereas using high effort exercise with intermittent uh, 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 frequencies and adequate recovery, again, such as high intensity interval training, seems to have a bigger effect. Now, Interestingly, and further supporting this idea that you can have significant improvements independent of exercise modality, um, as long as intensity of effort is high, um, Lundberg and colleagues have used a model of aerobic exercise where they have the participants perform roughly 40 minutes of exercise at 70% of their max power output. And then for the last one to five minutes of the exercise, they ramp the, the uh, power output up and have the participants cycle until they can't move the pedals anymore. So they essentially have the participants do a set cycling to muscular failure. And these studies, again, consist show considerable improvements in strength and hypertrophy as a result of this aerobic exercise mo uh, uh, model. So what sort of mechanisms could be involved in that? And again, I'm not going to get bogged down in too much detail with regards to these, but in their review, Nocker and Harbour have suggested that there are a number of factors associated with um, potentially reduced protein degradation, uh, and that's potentially through enhanced oxidative capacity, enhanced energy utilization as a result of the typical adaptations produced by aerobic training. But again, I think there are potentially other mechanisms that might be involved as well. So no unit recruitment might be an important factor, again, relating to intensity of effort and thinking about Henneman's size principle. Although peak amplitude seems to be quite low during endurance exercise, we need to remember that EMG amplitude isn't necessarily indicative of multi-unit recruitment. And as my colleague James is going to uh, talk about in a bit more detail, sequential recruitment of motor units occurs even during very low force, low torque, low load exercise, assuming it's Form to a high intensity of effort, and recruitment of motor units isn't necessarily reflected in EMG amplitudes. Uh, there also seems to be a potential mechanism through muscle cell swelling. So there's been recent reviews around the impact that cellular swelling can have on uh, hypertrophic response. And again, data from Ozaki's lab seems to show a higher effort Aerobic exercise seems to have a bigger impact, and again, studies that we've conducted uh, with Jürgen have shown that only in resistance exercise models where you train to failure do you seem to get a big improve, increase in uh, localized muscular swelling or certainly a greater increase. Um, there also seems to be a uh, response with regards to muscle protein synthesis. So although uh, the muscle protein synthesis response seems to be greater in, uh, in resistance training, there does seem to be quite a significant response in, uh, with regards to aerobic exercise. Um, but again, if we look at the studies by Lundberg and colleagues using that mode of exercise, of aerobic exercise, where they have been trained to failure, there seems to be a quite enhanced response with regards to muscle protein synthesis. So I think a lot of this suggests, in line with studies that we've seen from uh, McMaster's lab regarding low load resistance training compared to high load resistance training, that actually, if we're performing aerobic exercise type modalities to muscular failure, it's pretty similar to performing a low load set of resistance exercise to momentary muscular failure. So these may be some of the mechanisms through which we get these adaptations.
Okay, so again, let's quickly go back through these studies, which I spoke about earlier, and look at the strength outcomes in those that have reported them. So, in the Messier and Dill study, again, we see that there was an improvement in strength as a result of all of the interventions. There seemingly was a greater improvement in the Nautilus group that trained to failure using resistance exercise, um, but there was no significant difference in terms of the outcomes between the groups. Again, in the Goldberg study, we consider the fact that there are limitations potentially with the statistics used here, but they did report or at least claim that there was a significantly greater improvement in strength for resistance exercise and that there was either a no change or very small decrease in the endurance running and controls group. Heppel and colleagues, they looked at muscle fiber cross-sectional area and again, they reported uh, 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 that there was a significant change in the resistance training group, but not in the aerobic training group, but again, no between group comparisons were reported. Jabrius and colleagues looked at uh, strength using a leg press dynamometer, and they also looked at muscle cross-sectional area and volume using MRI, and uh, they did show that there was significant improvement in resistance exercise, but only a very small improvement in aerobic exercise, but again, no between group comparisons. Lastly, again, Wilkinson and colleagues, and this echoes their findings uh, with regards to changes in oxidative capacity. There were improvements in strength in the aerobic exercise group, certainly with regards to the one rep max, but a larger improvement in the resistance exercise group. However, that may be related to the specificity of training effect. The group that trained using resistance training actually trained using the test that they were uh, going to be performing. So they were using knee extension as opposed to cycling. So that may explain that. Okay, so again, similar to uh, the initial question as to whether or not resistance exercise can impact cardiorespiratory fitness, most studies, though again not all, seem to show that aerobic exercise has some positive effect on strength and hypertrophy. And it seems to be dependent upon the modality of exercise used, uh, which seems to be related upon, uh, with the uh, type of, uh, oh, sorry, the style of performance in which people uh, perform that exercise. So the higher effort modalities seem to be more beneficial. But again, the caveat is that there's a limited number of studies in this area, and most of them have not directly compared the magnitude of changes between these two modalities. But last minute addition, and I only came across this a couple of days ago. Now, this isn't comparing different modes of exercise, but I think it highlights the importance of effort with regards to both aerobic and strength adaptations. So in this recent study, they had participants perform high-intensity interval training, high-intensity interval training with blood flow restriction, low intensity interval training or low intensity interval training with blood flow restriction. And you can see the typical reported uh, perceived exertions between these exercise modes in the low intensity one next to no exertion whatsoever. And the participants reported higher intensity of effort, oh sorry, higher perceived exertion in the higher effort exercise modes. And this was reflected in the adaptations produced as well. So certainly with regards to VO2 max, the three higher effort modalities produce significant improvements in both VO2 max, power output, and uh, power up uh, on set blood lactate accumulation. Um, interestingly, though, there seemingly was only a significant improvement in the uh, blood flow restriction with low intensity uh, interval exercise for strength. So the authors speculated there may be some sort of minimal volume threshold that needs to interact with intensity of effort with regards to producing that outcome. Okay, so let's move on to wrapping this up then. So one of the things that we're proposing and Again, caveat, it's based upon limited evidence at the moment, but I think enough to begin questioning and putting something alternative forward, is that we should potentially be looking at exercise from an effort-based paradigm. So this has already been proposed with regards to resistance exercise, as I said, so uh, Phillips and Winner and, uh, and uh, my colleagues have uh, uh, suggested that training to failure, certainly with resistance exercise, training with a high intensity of effort seems to produce greater adaptations. But I just want to highlight this point made uh, by uh, Stuart Phillips and Richard Winnett in their review paper that effort is internal to the person, can be created with a variety of protocols, and is not dependent upon a specific amount of external force. And I think this is the key with regards to how we characterize our exercise. Depend, independent of the actual external resistance used or the mode of exercise, as long as muscular contraction is of a high effort, we can seemingly produce improvements in a number of different independent fitness-related outcomes. And there seem to be a number of other outcomes which are very similar as well with regards to uh, exercise mode. So again, and these are some last-minute additions which I won't go into detail with, but in the last week I've come across these studies which have shown that the kind of respiratory and metabolic adaptation uh, responses to resistance training when performed at a low that equates to the lactate threshold 
are pretty much similar to that when aerobic exercise is performed at the lactate threshold. Uh, there seems to be no modality effect, really, of uh, the effect on sat satellite cell activation. And in this recent study, we looked at the immunosuppressive effects of exercise mode. They had two conditions, one where they performed exhaustive aerobic exercise and one where they performed resistance training to failure. And again, there was no difference in the results. So I think independent of modality, high effort exercise seems to have a big impact on positive health outcomes. So it seems to positively affect all the variables that we highlighted as important for reducing risk of all-cause mortality, but there also seems to be a number of other factors which are very similar in terms of outcome when we look at the two different modes of exercise. But again, the caveat is that intensity of effort is important in determining whether or not these adaptations are produced. Now, this is where I think it potentially has big public health impact. And this is a quote from uh, the paper that myself and James published last year. And I just want to read it out for you to try and highlight why I think it's important to potentially question the resistance at uh, aerobic exercise dichotomy. So the potential implications of questioning the existing paradigm are quite profound if found to be supported through further investigation. In light of the concept discussed herein, persons wishing to engage in exercise in order to improve the noted markers of health and fitness might be able to select from a wide range of potential exercise modalities in order to achieve this. The caveat being, regardless of the modality chosen, persons should aim to exercise to a high level of effort in order to maximize these benefits. Exercise utilizing high effort and shorter duration addresses the potential barrier of time in exercise participation. Further, the notion that exercise modality may be inconsequential potentially addresses the perception that specialized equipment and or facilities are required, thus opening up a range of possibilities for laypersons wishing to improve health, fitness, and muscle size effectively. So I think this is where we potentially have a big impact or, or there's the potential for a big impact. Now, in terms of future directions, I think we do need more rigorous randomized controlled trials directly comparing aerobic exercise and resistance exercise modalities with regards to both acute mechanisms and chronic adaptations. I think one of the issues, again, with previous research as well is that the modality of exercise hasn't been the only independent variable that differs between the groups and the studies where they've compared them. And in fact, myself and my colleagues have some studies in the works at the moment, which we're hoping to begin data collection on very soon, looking at comparing comparing two different models of resistance and aerobic exercise where we have tried to control for a number of different training variables um, and only differ the mode between those. So uh, watch this space and we may have some data, uh, more robust data around that soon. But I think with regards to the public health outcomes, and I think this is the most important factor really, is that we need to start looking at the potential impact of widening participation through letting people know that you can choose any kind of exercise mode and probably it's best to choose a mode which you enjoy and just do it to a high intensity of effort. But we should start looking at public health trials using things like the REAIM framework to see whether or not this has an increased impact on uh, reach, the effectiveness of the intervention, the adoption of exercise as an intervention, and the implementation and maintenance of these types of interventions. So, just to wrap up and conclude then. So, both cardiorespiratory fitness and strength and muscle mass seem to play very important roles in health and longevity. And it seems to be that high effort uh, during physical activity or exercise mediates this largely. Now, traditionally, the dichotomy in exercise physiology holds that resistance exercise improves strength and uh, muscle mass, whereas aerobic exercise seems to improve cardiorespiratory fitness. However, I think there's some evidence to question whether this is the case. High effort resistance exercise seems to produce improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness, and high effort aerobic exercise seems to improve strength and hypertrophy. And there's some potential evidence around mechanisms mediating these adaptations that question it also. But again, and I keep reiterating this caveat, that the evidence directly comparing the two is limited. And there may be some evidence for similar outcomes, but we need far better studies before we can pin our hat on that. Lastly, again, just to reiterate, because I think this is really important, I think this potentially has huge impacts with regards to public health. Using models of high intensity of effort exercise, such as the model used at Kiesa training, can potentially have a huge impact on participants with regards to their health and longevity by focusing on higher intensity of effort exercise and not worrying too much about the mode of exercise. We can potentially have a much wider impact on public health agenda. So thank you for listening. It seems as though I've run to time, so if we have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice presentation.
Uh, I will have more than a comment than uh, a question. Okay. So you chose VO2 peak or VO2 max as a uh, marker for cardiorespiratory fitness, but I mean this is not even half of the story because your VO2 peak is only a composite physiological measure, which is composed of uh, central components and say um, cardiac output, which is determined by stroke volume per. Uh, uh, heart rate and uh, arterial venous oxygen uh, difference. So, and the real question is how do these two training modalities differentially affect the diffusive oxygen transport and the convective oxygen transport? And now, this is actually pretty clear from the literature. So, when you perform resistance exercises or any type of, res of exercise, if you are a non trained or deconditioned person, you may have an increase, for example, in mitochondrial volume, capillarization, all these things are pretty peripheral. So they may affect oxygen extraction from, from the blood, but they will never affect or seldomly affect the central component. In fact, there were no data showing actually that with resistance exercise you can only achieve concentric uh, cardiac hypertrophy, but not yet the typical eccentric cardiac hypertrophy observed with endurance exercise. So, I think we really should in, uh, disentangle these uh, these components because otherwise it's just we, we end up in a mess, uh, not differentiating between these important factors. No, yeah, I totally agree. And, and one of the things we did in our review, we did conclude that there was no evidence to suggest that there were any central myocardial adaptations in response to resistance exercise. And uh, one of the issues I have with that area, though, certainly relating to resistance exercise, is we don't have very many intervention studies that have actually looked at that very well. A lot of it seems to be um, cross-sectional data on uh, athletes either performing bodybuilding or powerlifting uh, interventions. Um, so I, I think, again, it's a fertile area. You're quite right. There's no evidence at the moment. Uh, but it's certainly a fertile area for um, well-controlled RCTs to actually look at that as an outcome, um, but you're right, no, no one's looked at it yet, um, so it was difficult to draw any conclusions on it at the moment. Thank you very much. Second question, and it's weite Frage. James. Where am I looking? Just down the front. <laughs> James, uh, we're looking at a, a research study on a, a cardiac patient group, and but I think this question applies to everyone. The, the first response that we get from cardiologists um, and anyone involved in you know, typical uh, rehab programs, which would be aerobic in their modality, um, is a concern around risk. So as we increase intensity, does, does risk increase? Uh, and then the other one is compliance as well. Um, higher intensity, does it affect compliance? I was just wondering what your thoughts were on those two. Yeah, okay. With regards to the published literature around complications during training in, in those types of populations, um, the, again, there's very few studies that have actually looked at it. Um, but in those studies that have, it seems that actually, um, certainly during resistance exercise, there seems to be uh, less of a stress on the, uh, on the uh, myocardium during the exercise. Um, and, and part of that might be mediated by the uh, peripheral skeletal muscle pump enhancing venous return. And certainly in studies that have recorded and reported uh, complications during either aerobic exercise or resistance exercise in those types of patients, there seems to be a lower rate of complications during exercise in the resistance exercise uh, groups. Um, but again, you know, I'll, I'll give the typical kind of scientist's response that, that we can do more, more, more research around that. Um, certainly with regards to adherence though, um, and this is an interesting thing, uh, one of the reasons why, and, and for anyone who's not read it, I highly recommend uh, reading the uh, paper um, that was published uh, uh, after Alan Batter and Stu Biddle's debate around high intensity interval training, because I think a lot of the factors that they discuss with regards to um, adherence apply to resistance exercises and mode as well, because it's typically characterized by shorter duration, lower volume, and a higher intensity of effort. Um, it seems to be that there's a kind of uh, interaction between the intensity of effort of the exercise and the volume of the exercise. So 
With regards to um, high intensity interval training as a model, um, when performing a high effort uh, exercise bout um, above you know, ventilatory threshold um, for an extended period of time, there seems to be an impact on potentially psychological factors that might mediate um, adherence to a long term program. Um, there's not the long term data on that at the moment. Again, that's something we're missing. Um, but when you look at resistance um, training as well as a mode, there seems to be a similar kind of interaction. And um, if you look at uh, the uh, Haas study that looked at single and multiple set resistance training, in which they had one group perform resistance training uh, to failure of one set, one group performed three sets to failure, and there was a much greater dropout rate in the three sets to failure groups, so or higher volume but still with a high intensity of effort. Um, and I hope Jürgen doesn't mind me saying this because he's put some of the data up from that study already. Uh, but we currently have a, a paper in review which has looked at um, single set to failure um, using advanced training techniques uh, and a group that performed three sets but only trained to a self-determined repetition maximum. So they stopped when, when they thought they were one set away from, uh, one rep, sorry, away from failure. So it was a slightly lower intensity of effort. Um, and although we showed greater strength improvements in the group that trained to failure, adherence rates uh, were, were pretty similar between the groups. Um, and we also looked at motivation to continue with the training and there seemed to be uh, similar motivations to continue training. So it seems as though high effort exercise you know, seems to be fine in terms of uh, adherence and motivation to continue with that training. However, if you extend the volume as well as the intensity too much, then people start to drop off in terms of adherence. Thank you very much. Thank you.